All right, so in our notes, we got big number D. Big number D is the muckrakers. Muckrakers, that's a job. So a muckraker is an investigative reporter. It's somebody who exposes corruption. An investigative reporter, somebody who exposes corruption. Now we're in the progressive era. So the progressive, so these muckrakers are super, super important. These muckrakers drive the progressive era, right? We have two big forces that are going on. We have the unions pushing for, for political and social change. And then we have the muckrakers who are exposing corruption, exposing problems and, and getting people motivated to, to change things, right? The muckrakers are kind of like the intellectual driving force and the unions are kind of like the, um, you know, everyday powerful driving force, okay? So um, the muckrakers, uh, we have a bunch of magazines like McClure's magazine is very, McClure's is a magazine that doesn't exist anymore, but at the time was very famous for exposing corruption. And they would expose corruption inside of companies, inside of the government, inside of like city governments, inside the federal government, right? Um, all over the place, all over the place. Now, these are three of our most famous muckrakers that start off, but they're not my favorites. Um, David Graham Phillips down here, he investigated like congressional um, corruption, exposed a whole bunch of congressmen who were like taking money. Um, Lincoln Steffens ex exposed uh, the corruption of like St. Louis, Missouri, and like all the corrupt politicians who were in St. Louis. Julius Chambers uh, is related to who we're going to talk about, but Julius Chambers um, exposed a bunch of um, like abuse of prisoners in hospitals and stuff where people would abuse the prisoners. Um, the one that I really want to get into, one of my all-time favorites is a woman named Nellie Bly. Let's put her as number E. Big number E, Nellie Bly. Okay, Nellie Bly. She's one of my all-time favorites. She's one of my heroes of American history. I love her. All right, so Nellie Bly is famous for a couple of things. She's, first off, she's a muckraker. That's her, her profession, she's a muckraker. Um, and what she would do is she's, she's most famous for publishing her book, uh, 10 Days in a Madhouse. 10 Days in a Madhouse. What she did is she got herself um, admitted into a, an insane asylum. She pretended to be insane and she got put into that insane asylum um, on purpose, okay? She was not insane, but she knew that, um, that mental health people were being abused and she knew that people were being abused and she knew that particularly women were being abused. So she gets herself admitted into this thing. Um, the doctors at the insane asylum don't know that she's sane. They don't know that she's undercover. Um, as she gets in there, she is abused. They, um, they, they basically torture her almost, right? They call it medical care. They call it medical care, but really it's not. It's like they starve her, they starve them, they like hit them, right? Like when mental patients would um, have a problem, would like have a breakdown crying or something like that, they would beat them until they stopped crying you know, or um, they would starve them. She got tied up to a chair and left on the chair for like a day, a full day, um, because they were treating her as insane. Um, and she, she acted insane. She tried to act insane. She like, you know, messed up her hair and she tried to act like all crazy and say crazy things and do crazy things and stuff. And they kept on amping this up, abusing her more and more and more. Um, after 10 days, after 10 days, she gets a message out to um, a friend of hers on the outside who kept coming in and checking up, right? And she gets the message saying, this is too much. I need to get out of here, right? She had planned to stay in there for a month, but the abuse was so bad that she gets out after 10 days and she writes her book, 10 Days in an Insane Asylum. And um, her book gets published and it causes this uproar across the country because the whole country is like, is is just really upset about what's going on and particularly the abuse of women okay um we if this is part of what you need to put in here right nelly bly is a women's rights activist as well um women get accused of being insane 
uh, much, much more than men do, much, much more. Um, the entire word, you guys know the word hysterical? Have you heard that word before? We say she's acting hysterical. What does it mean if I say, if I say she's acting hysterical, how is she acting? Katie, what does that mean? If I say she's acting hysterical. Um, she's usually just like crazy, but not like too bad. Okay, right. She could be crazy. She's like really high energy, manic, right? She's like running around maybe, right? Um, it's a word that is gendered. It doesn't, I've never heard it used on a man before. I've never heard a man being hysterical. Um, and it actually comes from the Greek word, uh, a Greek word, I forget what the Greek word is, but it's the Greek word for like the uterus essentially, right? And this idea is that women who don't have sex regularly enough will go crazy and they'll go crazy and they'll act crazy, which is why men have to constantly, you know, have sex with women, right? Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's an excuse for men to, you know, force themselves onto women, essentially, is they'll say, so they'll say stuff like, oh, she's, she's just going crazy. She just needs sex, right? Um, doctors at the time actually invent, you know, sex toys, what we would recognize today as like sex toys and stuff, but they would use them forcibly on women in these insane asylums to try to cure, cure the insanity, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So Nellie Bly starts writing about that and writing about how um, women get diagnosed with depression more than men do. Women get diagnosed with hysteria more than men do. Women get diagnosed with all sorts of mental illnesses in, at a way that men just never get diagnosed with, right? And once women are diagnosed, women are abused in a way that men are not being abused. So um, her book is changing. It's a really, really life-changing kind of, kind of book. And a lot of people look at this. Now she also, she does some other stuff too. She's actually like a pretty kind of a quirky, cool individual. She also travels around the world in 80 days because the book Around the World in 80 Days had come out and she said, I could do that. And so she travels around the world in 80 days on like ships and hot air balloons and stuff. Like she, she actually does that and like prints books about that and stuff too. Like she's, she's a pretty cool person. Um, there's an assignment on her on Canvas you can do, you know, have some stuff to read about her and stuff. She's, she's pretty cool. She's one of my, my heroes of American history. Um, and she's, she's a woman's rights activist that isn't like in the street arguing for voting. She's arguing for something else. She's arguing for better treatment in the medical field or better treatment in, in other aspects of the world. Um, one of the other theory themes that we're going to see, and you can put this in the next line down in your notes here, is that women are going to be forgotten in the medical field for a very, very long time. For most of world history, this isn't just American history, but for most world history, women are just ignored in medical, um, medical tests and, and to test out medicines and stuff. Um, as you get older, there's some, there's some cool, really interesting books. I was going to say cool, but it's not cool. It's kind of terrifying um, books about like the medical world, about how women just don't get diagnosed with stuff, right? Um, there's uh, women die of overdoses much more than men do. And that's because the dosages for medicine are, is usually all for men, for men's bodies. And the, you know, men are bigger than women, right? And so, um, most women need to take whatever the recommended dosage is and cut it down, right? Because it's, because they're smaller, right? If I'm a 250 pound man, right? And my wife is a five foot one woman, right? She and I should not be taking the same amount of medicine, right? That's not, that's not right. We just have a different body, right? Um, there was actually a really interesting medical study about this where they were talking about, they were talking about, uh, uh, they were talking about women being overly medicated or, or being disproportionately medicated. And um, they were talking about this and they asked the, the company, they asked the pharmaceutical company, they said, hey, how many people did you test this medicine on? And they said, oh, we tested a thousand people on this medicine, right? And then, the, and then the reporter asked them, well, how many of those thousand people were women? It should be 500, right? Right, if you test a thousand people, 500 should be women. And the company comes back and says, we didn't have any women in the study, no women at all. And the reporter said, well, why didn't you have any women in the study? And they said, well, 
women's hormones just aren't normal. And so uh, it's unpredictable how women's hormones will interact with our drug. And so we didn't want it, we didn't want that to be a problem, right? The medicine that they were asking about was a medicine for menstrual cramps. No joke, menstrual cramp medicine, right? And the story I just told you was in 2001. Okay, this is not like 1887, but Nellie Bly is diagnosing a problem in 1887 that we still have today, right? They were testing menstrual cramp medicine on a thousand men, and then they said women's hormones will mess up the medicine, right? The reporter said, a medicine that is intended for women should probably be able to interact with women's hormones, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? This isn't like, it isn't like, I don't know, testicle medicine or something, right? Like it's literally any medicine should be able to interact with women's hormones, right? If half the population has those hormones, then that's not abnormal. That would be normal, right? Like anyway, there's a, there's a, we have a book in the library on that, that I've, it's listed, like if you go to the library, it's listed as my favorite book in there, right? And it's a, just a nightmarish book about like women's medical care. They, this is going to come up all through the through the rest of the class. Um, women weren't allowed to run marathons um, all the way until 1965 because they thought if a woman runs too much, her uterus will fall out on the ground. No joke. That was like medical professionals would publish articles about how women's uteruses will fall out if they run too much, right? And a billion women who have run in their lifetime all said, no, that's not how it works. They used to believe at the time, at the time, at Nellie Bly's time, all the way up until like the 1950s and 60s, they used to believe that a woman's uterus was detachable and that it would float around in her body, right? And it would float in her body and when, um, based on her menstrual cycle, right? And when she would have her period is when the uterus would lodge itself in the bottom and then it would bleed for a while and then it would float around and it would stay floating there until she got pregnant and then the baby would lock it down. I'm not making this up. That was like normal medical science at the time, right? And it's because they wouldn't, they wouldn't like dissect women's bodies, like cadavers and stuff. They wouldn't dissect women's bodies. They wouldn't diagnose women. Women, uh, women were not allowed to be doctors. And so the only doctors allowed were men and men weren't allowed to examine any part of a woman that was improper, right? Which means there's a lot of uh, a lot of organs that are being ignored. Essentially, is what's going on. How did these on. rules even come about? Say it how again. Rules, how did these rules even be like come about being created? Yeah. So it's it, it was it. It, this, this is time period is called the Victorian time period of global history, right? And it's this time period where sex is really, really scary and, and prohibited and you're not allowed to talk about it. And women were expected to be really prim and proper and men were expected to respect women in that way. And so the result is that hundreds of thousands of women die from, um, you know, things like uterine cancer and, you know, and at various different problems with, you know, ovaries and uteruses and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. And, and Nellie Bly is our first really good solid example of diagnosing that. Right. And she diagnoses a problem that people will ignore all the way up until like the two thousands when they start realizing the problem. There's this concept of like, what is a default human, right? If I tell you, if I tell you, describe a human, most of you will probably describe a man, right? If I try, tell you to draw a stick figure and you'll draw a stick figure, right? And just like hands, and the two lines, right? The lines for the hands, the lines, lines for the legs and the circle on the top, right? And I say, what is this? Most people on the planet earth will call it a person, a man. We'll call it a man, even though a could easily be a woman, right? It's literally a line in a circle, right? Like it's, there's no reason why it has to be a man. But this concept is from a sociological standpoint that the default human is man. And if the default human is man, 
then when you are creating products, you test them for men. And it's just accepted, it's expected that women will just adjust themselves to whatever the man thing is, right? Ladies, probably this is true. If you go to the locker room, how many of the lockers, how many times do you see women who can't use the top of their locker very easily, right? Because the locker, if you try to, like in a locker room in a gymnasium, the most of the time, the top shelf is so high that something like a third of women can't even use it or can barely use it, right? They have to like get up, you know, stand on the bottom of the locker to reach it or something like that, right? That's because the locker is made for default person. Default person is a five foot 10 man, right? Ladies, how many of you are cold in a classroom or in an office? Like usually, oftentimes cold in classrooms and stuff like that, right? Well, that's because the thermostat is set for men. No joke, when they invented the thermostat, they put it, they had like an office and then they put 50 people in the office and they measured the body heat that those 50 people produced and then they adjusted the temperature. If the thermostat says 70 degrees, it's not actually 70 degrees. The thermostat is actually 67 degrees usually, 67 or 66. And that's because of the body heat generated by the 50 men in the room, right? But these are men wearing business suits. Well, today, half of the office are going to be women and they're going to be wearing, you know, whatever, short sleeves and skirts and, you know, things that aren't business suits, right? We're going to be wearing things that aren't business suits. And so the temperature rightfully should be raised, but it's not because default is man. Yeah, Nellie Bly didn't fully, she wasn't fully aware that she was exposing that. But today, when we look back on what she did, we can see that she's very clearly exposing that. She didn't, she didn't know what she was doing at the time. She didn't realize that's what she was doing, but she was exposing the patriarchy. Yeah. Kind of cool, huh? I think she's pretty cool. I mean, she's, she's a really cool person. All right, let's go to, should we do Francis Willard? Yeah, let's do Francis. All right, Ms. Willard. So Francis Willard, big number F. F for Francis. Ha ah, it worked. Okay, F for Francis, uh, Francis Willard. Now, Francis Willard is a social activist. She's the founder of the Christian Temperance Union. Founder of the Christian Temperance Union. She's not a muckraker, but she's active at the same time. She is the founder of the Christian Temperance Union. Temperance, in this case, means no alcohol. So she's the founder of the organization meant to destroy alcohol. She wants to make alcohol illegal. Okay, um, we'll call it prohibition. When it gets passed, we call it prohibition, but temperance was the word that they were using in the beginning, right? So she's the founder of the Christian Temperance Union. And what she's trying to do is she's trying to address what she believes to be the number one social issue in America at the time, which is alcohol, too much alcohol, okay? Now the average man is drinking more than a liter of, a liter of hard liquor a day, a liter of, of like whiskey a day, right? The average man is drinking this much whiskey every single day. The average woman is drinking much less, something like a third of a liter a day. Um, but this means half of the men of the country are drinking more than a liter a day. Um, and she will argue that um, women should have the right to vote Women should have the right to vote because women are morally superior to men. This is her argument, that women should have the right to vote because women are morally superior to men. Now, this is kind of an old argument, right? This is an old Christian argument, if we've heard this before, right? I bet you guys have heard some version of this in the past, something along the lines of, God blessed women with the ability to have children Therefore, they are morally superior because mothers are supposed to teach children, right? Where men were blessed with the ability to run a government and, and run society, right? But the problem is that men are so easily corrupted by things like wars and money and things like that, which is why it's important that women don't participate, right? You heard that argument before, right? 
I still hear that argument today. Like people, someone was making an argument with my wife on Facebook about that like yesterday, right? About that kind of thing. Um, so Francis Willard is making the argument that women just have better, better decision making. And so women um, choose not to drink alcohol. Therefore, women should be the driving social force with destroying alcohol and getting rid of alcohol. Okay. Frances Willard actually is a very, very important woman for getting women's rights, women's vote. She actually gets a lot of the states to pass women's voting. And a lot of the states, especially down south, like North Carolina, South Carolina, like the, the Carolinas and Tennessee, Kentucky, they, a lot of them pass, pass the vote for women, pass the um, 19th Amendment to get women to vote because of alcohol, because they want women to get alcohol, make alcohol legal. A lot of them do. Yeah. Let's jump to, I'm going to jump ahead. We're going to stick with some women today. Today is going to be all women, all women, all day long. All right. So let's go to uh, G, big number G. She's not a muckraker, but she's at the same time period. And she's really, really cool. Emily Dickinson. She's a culturally very important person. Emily Dickinson is probably the greatest poet the United States has ever produced. She's probably the greatest poet the United States has ever produced. We've produced a lot of pretty good ones, but she's probably number one. She's my personal favorite also, in addition to being number one. Um, so Emily Dickinson has a well, let's read her poem first, and then we'll talk about her biography, okay? Um, uh, Allison, can you read nice and clear? Do you have a nice clear mic today? I think so. Yeah, you're sounding clear. Can you read it for us? Okay. Sure. I can't see the bottom part, though. Uh, okay, I'll fill in the bottom part when it gets cut off. Okay. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where the children, where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed fields of grazing grain. Uh, we passed the setting sun, or rather he passed us for the dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my groan, my tippet only two. <laughs> We passed before that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, to centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day I first submerged the horses' heads which were toward eternity. That's where I left off. That's the bottom. That's the last line. All right. So, not Allison. What does that mean? Someone who's not Allison. Aaron, Lindy, Rain, Will, Sina, one of you guys. Aaron, start us off, man. What, what do you think this is about? Uh, I mean, it seems to be about just as in the beginning, but it seems to also be passing her life from like the talk about schools and our house. Aaron, Aaron you, I can't, I can't hear you at all. Are you guys having a problem hearing Aaron? You guys are having a problem too? Yeah, Aaron, we can't, we can barely hear you at all. Let's try Lindy. I'm Get a lot of it, but in the second part, uh, no. Um, let's, tr let's try it again, Lindy. He knew no haste, and I had to put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. Um, I think it might be talking about um, kind of women had to do a lot of things for men. I'm not certain though. Okay, who's the he? Who is um, he? Can you hear me? Am I good? 
Yeah, I can hear you now, Rain. Okay, I think it's about death. Mm -hmm. Is it? With, I think it's like personified death and how it's creeping to mm -hmm. you. Like, right. Because I go. think it says we are toward eternity. Right. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Who's he? Death. He is death, right? The personification of death, just like Rain said, right? Like the, you know, black robe, skull face, scythe thing, right? She couldn't stop for death, so death stopped for her. The carriage held but just ourselves in immortality, right? So death is riding on a carriage. She gets in the carriage with him. We slowly drove. He knew no haste. And, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility, right? So what does it mean I put my labor and leisure away? What does she do? Is she working still? No. Is she doing leisure still? Is she having pleasure still? No. No, right? She died. Right? She died and now the death is carrying her, right? And his civility, I like the idea that death is civil, right? It means he's polite, he's calm, he's polite, he's civil. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain, this past the setting sun. What's going on in this stanza? Will, what do you think is going on in this stanza? Uh, they're passing all the people who are still alive and right right we have a lot of symbols of life in here right what's a symbol of life what do we have what's our symbols of life the children children what else the sun the sun no. well the setting sun would maybe represent her right right Right, a school, children, recess, grain, right, and the sun, all of those are, set, are symbols of life. And in this case, the sun is setting, right? Her life is coming to an end, right? Or rather he passed us, the dews drew quivering and chill for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tool. So gossamer is like spider webs. So she's saying that her gown is made of spider webs. Right, and uh, my tippet is only tool. Tippet is like a, 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 hat, a hat that you women would wear when they went to sleep, like a sleeping cap, kind of, right? And tool is a, um, just like a lacy fabric. A lacy fabric, like what you would lay on a woman in her um, coffin, right? Katie, help me out with this one. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground the roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Um, is that supposed to be like the afterlife? What's the swelling of the ground? What does that make you think of? Oh, like a cemetery. Mm -hmm. Right, the, we passed before a house. So her new house, if she's dead, what's her new house? The coffin. Yeah. Like the cemetery. <laughs> uh huh. The roof is scarcely, vi scarcely visible, right? So it's like barely coming out of the ground. The cornice, you guys know what a cornice is? A cornice is the top corner of a roof, like where we would have a gutter or something, right? If you have the um, molding on the inside of a house, it, sometimes it'll be the molding on the top, around the corners of the top of a room or something like that. That's what the cornice is. On like Chinese buildings, it's the pointy part that turns up. That's called a cornice. Okay. All right. Since then, tis centuries, and oh come on, you stupid thing. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day. I first surmised the horse's head were towards eternity. So this whole poem is about death, right? And she is dead in the poem. Um, Emily Dickinson writes uh, hundreds and th thousands of poems. She writes thousands of poems and in thousands of poems, she's dead. She writes about death a lot, right? Probably half of her poems are about death, probably. 
So if half of her poems are about death, what do you expect if I tell you her biography? What are you going to expect? What do you think? That she was depressed? Yeah, she's got crushing depression. And what do you think is eventually going to happen to her? Suicide? Yeah, yeah. So you've anticipated correctly. Emily Dickinson was a, was a, a poet. She's a poet who um, had a lot of different mental illness problems. Um, she, she suffered from depression. She suffered from um, a bunch of different issues. One of the, uh, one of the issues that she had, um, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence that she was also gay. There's quite a bit of evidence that she was a lesbian, but it was illegal to be gay at the time. You, you, weren't, you, you could literally go to jail for being gay. Um, and so she was living in the closet figuratively, she also eventually lives in a closet, in a closet, literally. Um, eventually, her mental health problems become so crushing that she spends the last like, um, t like five or six years of her life where she's wearing all white. The only thing she's wearing is white. And she has a dog that she, she writes about her dog oftentimes. And the dog is like the only thing in her life that she cares about. She has a sister that takes care of her. And um, eventually Dickinson gets so um, scared of the outside world that she suffers from something called agoraphobia. Do any of you guys know what agoraphobia means? What is it, Rain? Um, it's basically like extreme social anxiety. Like you cannot talk to anyone. It gets really bad. Yeah. And her, and in her case, it gets so, you're absolutely correct, Rain. And in her case, it gets so, uh, Agoraphobia. I just put it in the chat so you can spell it into your notes. She becomes so agoraphobic that she won't leave her house. And then she becomes so agoraphobic that she won't leave the closet in the back of her house. And she literally lives in the closet. And she spends the last couple of years living in a like you know, a, a closet, like literally like a clothing closet. And that's where she sleeps. That's where she eats. That's where she does everything. And her sister brings her food and stuff, you know, and she would like go to the bathroom in a pot and her sister would, you know, take it out. She eventually kills herself. Um, she dies pretty early. She only, she only dies at like 36 years old. Um, and she never published her poetry while she was alive. I think she published a little bit of her poetry, but once it started becoming popular, she refused to publish anything. Most of her poems don't even have names. She just numbered them all. Um, she numbered them all and her sister, after Dickinson died, her sister publishes them. Most of them aren't named, they're just numbered and we just call them the number and then whatever the first line is, is what we, we do this. And we have, there's, I think there's like 1500 poems, I think, something like that. And um, they got published as like collections and stuff after she died. And once that came up, it really tapped into something. It really tapped into something because she had this like emotional clarity about her, right? That she's able to talk about things that most people don't want to talk about. Most people are very uncomfortable talking about death and very uncomfortable talking about this. And she's, you know, kind of embracing it in a way. I find it beautiful. I find her story beautifully tragic and I find her poetry absolutely stunning. Um, and it becomes a cultural phenomenon at the time. It becomes culturally relevant and culturally important to American history. Um, the United States largely is a country of storytellers, right? If we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be an American? Um, one of the answers is we're storytellers, right? We tell a lot of stories. Stories are big business for America, right? Fiction is big, big business. Hollywood is big business, right? We can put out an Avengers movie and make $2 trillion. We could put out an Avengers movie and make as much money as entire countries make in a year, right? We, and we do it not just once, we do it like 50 times a year, right? In all these different whatever movies that we put out and stuff, right? It's big business. We have the largest publishing companies in the world. We have the largest movie companies in the world. We have the largest television. We have the largest, whatever, podcasts and tele like everything, right? We're storytellers. We're a nation of storytellers. And in a nation of storytellers, Dickinson stands out as the one who can tell us the story of her emotions. 
in a way that no one else can. On that note, I think we're done. I think we'll leave it at that. And 